January is Volcano Awareness Month on Hawaii Island, and last week marked the 30th anniversary of Kilauea's East Rift Zone eruption, which began on January 3, 1983. The volcanic activity continues today. The lava flows bring wonder and attention to the island, but also destruction. The USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory counts 214 structures that have been destroyed by lava since the eruption began. Yet, while Madame Pele takes, she also gives. The National Park Service says about 500 acres of new land has been added to the island since 1983. The fissure that began this 30-year eruption at first produced towering lava fountains, which eventually became the Pu'o crater that we know today. In the years since, fast-moving lava flows have destroyed homes in the Royal Garden subdivision and the seaside village of Kalapana. When Big Island Video News arrived to document the eruption in 2008, there was an ongoing lava ocean entry that served as a spectacle for residents and tourists alike. Hawaii County set up a viewing area to maintain some control over the waves of visitors to the lava flow. Sometimes the activity was subdued, and at other times it seemed like the whole world was on fire. To the highest bushes that you see straight ahead, there's like one straight stick sticking up. If okay, you can now where's the picture the before this? From that point was highway till here. And in the last 24 hours, the lava um, coming down the slope in a new tube has been able to feed this surface activity and covered the road right here in the last 24 hours. And the lava overnight advanced from the road to just beyond where you see the bushes burning is the front of this flow field still moving toward the ocean. You'll probably have a nice view from up on the flat right there where the vehicles are parked looking down onto the flow field and you'll be able to pick out the glow of where the surface activity has extended itself. We can't see it from right here. When you are up this hill a little bit and you look up on the slope, you'll see us uh, the furthest east covered with gases rising up from that tube. All of that whitish smoke that you see is gas rising up from underground. And that's the tube that's feeding this. It breaks out once it gets to the bottom of the poly, the bottom of the hillside. We're going to have to ask you to go back on the roadway, please. This is all private property this way. Thank you. A hike to get closer is best undertaken in the company of experts. Geologist Tim Orr guided our camera out to see the site in 2010. Over my shoulder behind us, we can see the Waikupanaha Ocean Entry. It's where lava is uh, erupting from Kilauea's East Drift Zone, traveling through a lava tube system, and this is where it reaches the ocean. It's easy for you to be dehydrated. If you're not familiar with the area, not familiar with hiking perhaps, it's, it's tough hiking. It's like doing stairs all day. You're up and down, up and down. So it's a two-mile hike here is a lot more difficult than a two-mile hike on a trail somewhere. There's no official name. We've been calling it the Waikupanaha tube just because this is the White, we've called this the Waikupanaha entry. And we call it the Waikupanaha entry because the Waikupanaha pond was somewhere right in here, which was a... A real pond? It was a real pond that was here prior to the flows coming down. This is the only tube system that's active on the volcano right now. This tube is rapidly approaching the longest lived tube system we've had on the volcano. The view can be just as good and a little less exhausting by air. Multiple tour companies take advantage of the show, charting helicopter tours above the volcano. All depends on the boat. This one's pretty spry, that's why we got it. But we soon learned that one of the best ways to see the event was by sea. There's that molten lava. On board the popular lava boat tours, like Lava Ocean Adventures. My family's been doing this with me for over 20 years now. It's always been a real special time. Come down here, get a fish on the way to the flow and back. And if it's uh, extra special, you might catch some fish, might see some lava. You never know what kind of marine life's gonna pop up around here. How's, how's today ranked for you? Today might as well be my first day out here. I feel like a little kid at a candy store. This is about as good as it gets. We got multiple flows down the whole coastline. I would say we have almost a mile of eruption zone with it seems as though uh, about 10 different major spots and drips of lava all over the place, coming over cliffs, uh, spewing right into the sea. And we also got all kind of sea arches being created on the ocean right now. All kind of action. Every walk of lava, all in one little spot. It all adds up to a sort of lava economy on the Big Island. 
The lava flow has also been an inspiration to many photographers over the years. Some folks, like Lee Hilbert, have spent long days documenting the activity around Kalapana, hiking for miles to get the shots that others don't have the fortitude for. Um, and by uh, the next day, by 4 p.m. the next day, uh, lava had actually touched the wood post at the base of the foundation of the house uh, on the west end, on the west facing side. And um, engulfed it completely by 4.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, it was on the ground completely uh, in embers by uh, an hour later. There's two sections to the home, so it took a little longer than it might normally to burn from one side to the other. There's a, a separate corridor between the two, but it, um, in fact it did, it did fall. Um, it was a spectacular scene. Uh, there was only uh, local friends and uh, the homeowner, Gene, uh, at the residence. Or Mick Halber, one of the top video volcanographers to film the eruption. I got here right after the start of the eruption, the current eruption in 1983. I got here in 1984. The volcano has amazed me since the first time I saw it. it it's, um, it's an event that really boggles the mind. You can't really wrap your mind around the fact that this is liquid rock flying up into the air thousands of feet, hundreds of feet or thousands of feet. Uh, when I first came here and the, the fountains were going off a thousand feet or fifteen hundred feet into the air, higher at that time than any building on the planet, um, I, I couldn't conceptualize what was happening. It was crazy. And then there are the lava ticks who actually live by the action. Uh, we consider ourselves lava ticks because a play on words but being lunatic. Well, we're not quite lunatics, but uh, we do love the lava, so we'll poke the fun at ourselves and call us, uh, ourselves lava ticks. And those of us who live here on the edge, we're fringers. And that's why the sign says that, you know, we have these personal characteristics, and there's a few of us. And I've met a lot of honorary future lava ticks out here, people who are locals and also um, visitors from all over the world who, once they come out here, see why it could easily become a Peggy Fallwind lost her spot to lava a short time after this interview. What it's like living out here is ups and downs, you know, in terms of nature, it's unbelievable. The few people, as you can see, there are not many households out here, and in fact, most of these buildings in front of your camera are unoccupied. Some, like Bo Losov, were eternally attracted to Madame Pele. It's just one of the most intense places in nature that exists in the world. Uh, the black pahoe hoe lava with no vegetation is like living in a very strange kind of desert. It's very dry here and yet right behind us is the ocean just a couple hundred yards and uh, there are no utilities anywhere within within 10-15 miles and so everyone out here is entirely self-reliant. But these are actually people's yards. I mean, I know it sounds strange, but this is my yard. When Lozov died at the end of 2012, his ashes were scattered in the lava field he loved so much. It's just going to be a big piece of rock. Unbelievable. Perhaps the highest profile lava tick of them all, Jack Thompson, who for a little more than 29 years withstood the eruption in his Royal Gardens home. Starting to look like surfs of the moon or something. <laughs> Even as it destroyed every other building in the ill-fated subdivision. They're probably by the time this is pow, it's going to be uh, nothing left. This is the second house I've had in this subdivision, so... I've been on this mountain about 40 years. He held out as long as he could. He even ran a bed and breakfast from his isolated home. I, I flew over this place uh, back then, and there wasn't any old lava flows or anything to, to indicate there would be any lava around here at all. It was just all pristine forest. There wasn't any flows back on the East Rift Zone. There wasn't any cinder cones until he got into the Volcanoes National Park. There wasn't any indication at all that there would be uh, this coming down, let alone for 30 years. But in 2011, Jack's stand ended. Uh, I think it's about the end of it. I don't think anybody would be living up here anymore. The ongoing destruction is a reminder of why it's important to understand how volcanoes work. That's why the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory has prepared a month-long series of talks and events about Kilauea, as well as the island's much larger Mauna Loa volcano, which is mercifully quiet at the moment, all with the intention of spreading the awareness of the island's greatest natural wonder. Only time will tell what the next 30 years have in store.